clip on social media of me giving David Huff a ride in my hot rod. Yeah. I wanted to give him a ride in that hot rod because I, a couple years ago, I gave him a ride in my SRT. And I'll never forget coming back from the airport. He looked at me and he said, now, Pastor, that's as fast as I've ever been in a car. So I said, I want to give you a ride in my, my 71 Challenger, David. And, uh, of course, Kenneth's just hopped in the back seat like I invited him. And, uh, and he said, are you going to go fast? And I said, well, if I don't, you won't remember it. So, Dennis, I pulled out, shot off down Baptist Encampment. And, and I don't do this all the time. I really don't. Uh, but I had him in there, so, you know, I, I hit the gears, went through it. I passed a construction truck, F-250, on the side of the road there, and I went on down to Exxon, made my turnaround, and I punched it. Boom, 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 through three gears. Got a little rubber, you know. Didn't want to spin too much. If you're spinning, you ain't winning, so you want to get on. So I moved on up the road and passed that construction truck again and went on down to the, you know, them corners. If you go out to the church in New Caney, you got, you got some curves. So I'm swinging around them curves, Tommy, and I hit that last curve. And that construction truck come right up on my back end. When he did, I sheared down on her, and I just, just left rubber and, and it hit the gear again. And got to the gate, and if you know anything about that back gate, it's kind of a, it's just a gate. And I call it the eye of the needle. And I love to stop before I get there and punch that dodge and let her slide through like that right there. And just, Wah! so everybody at the camp knows I'm there. So I come sliding in up to the office and. Brother Dave was just grinning, and Kenneth is grinning. And that construction truck pulled right up behind me, and on the side, it said, Montgomery County Sheriff. <laughs> Lucinda, y'all got a new truck. I, went, I did not recognize that truck. And he stuck his head out the window, and he said, What's up, boss? And he shows me his, his computer, and he said, we just got a call of somebody speeding on Baptist Encampment Road. So I came out here, and he said, I know it can't be you because I already got the call before you came out, but pastor, you were speeding. <laughs> and I said, ooh, you know, so I'm, I'm crawfishing a little bit. I mean, you didn't understand how to go crawfishing. And I said, oh, you, you work with Rowdy Hayden? He said, yeah, Rowdy and uh, Judge Metz. And I said, yeah, they're my friends. He said, yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> and then he smiled. He said, me and my wife came to Muscle Car Sunday last week. He said, that was a great show, man. We just loved it. And I knew right then, grace, grace, <laughs> wonderful grace was flowing all over the place right then. He said, you're good. You said, I know what you're doing. I said, well, that old man right there made me do all that. And I pointed it through, through David under the bus a little bit. And then after that, he, uh, he said, no, you're good. He said, I, I know what you were doing. You out here giving these guys a good time. He said, I'm going to let you go. And I, he said, it's all good. And I, then I just had to ask him. I said, well, how, how'd my car look when I came in? Oh, he said, she looked good. She looked good. And I said, all right. That's what I want. Amen. I mean, know oh, we're still in a season right now. Yeah. Even we're not out of this season yet. We've talked about overcoming 2020. It's, it's, a, it's a place we're at. And if you don't learn something going through this, uh, you're going to go through it again. So you've got to learn something as you're pressing through it. So I want to talk to you this morning about living through seasons. Not, not just getting a new season, but getting through this season. One of the saddest verses, I believe, in the Word of God is out of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet. He's known as the lamenting prophet. And he was upset. Lamenting means to cry, to mourn. And he looked at his nation, and he saw what was going on. And as a prophet, as far as I know, he never had a convert. He never had anybody come to God during his time of ministry. But yet he stayed with it because he was the one to get sounding out warnings. And Jeremiah was upset and bothered by Israel's idolatry and their pride. And he said, God's going to, you know, this is going to happen. And, and, and even though that, that uh, calamity had come upon them, they didn't turn to God. They didn't turn back to him. So he wrote in chapter 8, verse 20, the harvest is past. The summer, the season has ended and we're not saved. We've gone through all of this. Pandemics, protests, riots, we've been through economic hardships, we've been through uh, racial divides, we've been through all the things we've gone through, and still, we're not saved. We didn't learn anything from it, we didn't catch anything, and worse than that, we didn't turn to God 
when it should have happened. We turned to one another. We turned to our government. We turned to uh, other people, other places. But didn't turn back to God. So that's what he's saying here. Now listen, with the, the summer, the summer speaks of a season, a time. A time is a stretch of duration in which things happen. That's time. You were born at a certain time. You'll die at a certain time. It's a duration in which things happen. We use the word the dash, that dash which is in between. It will soon be over. Our time will. It's irretrievable. You don't get it back. You can never repeat it. You can't relive it. You got today, and then there'll be tomorrow, hopefully. That's why we can't stay shut in, and we can't do nothing the rest of this year. We got to live through this. Can I get an amen? amen. I love this statement by a friend of mine, Mark Filkey, in California. I wrote it down probably 20 years ago, but it just jumps all over me when he said, somewhere in infinity, God interrupted a place called eternity. I love this. Somewhere in infinity, God interrupted a place called eternity and created a space called time for a place called earth for a race called mankind. I'm going to say that again until it sinks in just a little. Amen. Somewhere in infinity, God interrupted a place called eternity and created a space called time for a place called earth for a race called mankind. In other words, God created time for us. He created the earth for us. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, For there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. I'm believing still for success in this season as we move through not only all the things, our drive-in services, our, uh, our, our conference last week, the, the car show, all those things. But first, before we get a new season, we got to live through this season. Everybody say go through. Come on, say it loud. In our own church, we're not covered and governed by fear. Fear does not own or control this house, but by faith. God's people must have a strategy. Hope is inspirational, but it's not a strategy. Hope is a wonderful thing to have, but it doesn't give you a, but you got to get your own plan. God's kingdom must still be financed. God's people must move forward, not backward. We learned that in the storms of life, we talked about this a little bit last week, that before a storm hits, prepare. Before, prepare. During, stand. After, clean up and go on. Pastor Kenner sent me a message. You know, he lives in DeRitter, just north of uh, Lake Charles, and, and Hurricane Delta went through there. You know, when uh, Delta hit, uh, thank God she didn't hit it down. Delta down. Amen. Okay. Amen. But she, she moved on up through there. And I, so he sent me a message yesterday. He said, I'm cutting trees again. Wind come through and knocked a bunch of trees down. And then this morning he sent me a message. He said, thank God I didn't bring those generators back to you. Right. Amen. Because their power's out again. So just keep getting hit and keep getting hit. So before a storm, make sure you prepare. Second, make sure you stand during and after. Clean up and go on. you got to seize the moment. The opportunity of a lifetime is only available in the lifetime of the opportunity. And when you have this opportunity right now, it's a good time to learn something and to grasp it. The purchase of uh, the little country church of the ranch, the purchase of this church. These were opportunities we had. Many of you know when I came through here, Lori and I did after a conference in California, there was a for sale sign on this church. We called the next morning. We paid, I, I, I don't mind telling you, we paid $680,000 for this. Talked them down from seven fifty, dollars put another seventy eighty dollars in the building, amen, to get it ready. A year later, I was offered $2.5 million for this property. Somebody said that was a good investment. Amen. We didn't take the offer. You're still sitting here. Come on, give God praise. Amen. Listen, you cannot seize what you cannot see. And once you, you get vision and you see things happen, you seize after it. Seasons of feeling uh, overwhelmed. There are times that I promise you, you felt overwhelmed in this season. You felt like I've stayed home. I did what uh, people have asked me to do. I, I'm concerned about, you know, I am leaving today uh, to go to Alabama. I, I need to see my mother. Her mother needs to see her son. I need to punch my brother. It's just, it's just what we do. Can I get an amen? Amen. So these things need to happen. But on that, I've been concerned for my mom. I've been concerned for my brother. I, I, I know these things about life. And you can feel a little bit overwhelmed. But after a while, you've got to say, God, I, I, I thank you that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen. I'm, it's greater than all these things that are coming against me. And you have your faith rise up and you believe God for the best. In Psalm 27, follow with me through a couple of verses. I think we're going to run about 14 verses here. But I want you to see what David did in the face of being overwhelmed. He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Everybody say, no fear. No fear. 
Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. When David talked about war breaking out, he meant war was breaking out. He knew that trouble was coming. So the first thing David began to focus on, he focused on his faith and he resisted his fear. I will be honest with you, everybody in this building has resisted fear. And it doesn't mean, well, Pastor, you're so good at No, for years I've taught you and taught me. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. It's taking risk. And I know right now there's risks that are being taken. But I have to keep building my fear and, I mean, building my faith and resisting my fear. There, there are times I'm in places I say, God, I'm fearful. What's going to happen? But I'm going to stand on you. I got to believe you for the best. Can I get an amen? amen. Next one, verse 4 says, one thing, David said, I ask of the Lord. And this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord to seek him in his temple So David began to practice serving God in the good times If I can tell you this if you got God in the good times You're gonna have him in the bad times and the only time you see God is when things are bad You're in trouble my friend not that God won't hear you But I promise you when your kids love you in the good times, you know, you're gonna help them in the bad times Amen, so he says for in the day of trouble. He will keep me safe in his dwelling He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle Set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above, above my enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle, his church, will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. So first he said, you know, I'm concerned about the men that want to destroy me, the war that's coming. But the truth of the matter is, I'm going to keep practicing God and loving God in the good times. Amen. He's going to take care of me. As a matter of fact, before the war ever starts, I think I'm going to sacrifice with a little shout of joy. Hallelujah! And he began to shout and worship and praise God. You know, and many times in our life, we only want to shout after we get win the lottery. Come on. I never seen anybody buy a lottery ticket and walk in. The, and almost everybody I know buy a lottery ticket, walk to the store to get it. At least in my neighborhood. Huh? Amen. You never see them shouting and walking away. It's when they come back in. But God wants us to shout before the victory. Amen. Verse 7 says, Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says, If you seek his face, your face, Lord, I will seek. He gave God what he wanted. Just like Mary at the feet of Jesus. That's why he couldn't push her away. He let her learn from him there and talk. I, there was more than a worship scene in that, in, that, in that scene. There was something else going on. He was teaching her. And here David says, you know, I want to give God what he wants. I want to give him worship. Worship is an outward expression of an inward love. Don't tell me you love God until you can express yourself. Amen. Amen. Let me talk to those online because I know they'll shout in their living room. <laughs> worship is an outward expression of an inward love. When you love somebody, you're going to express yourself. Amen. When you, love, when you love, you know, in sports, you express yourself. Why is it so hard to express yourself in church when you act like a darn fool at a football game? You ought to be able to express yourself. And I know a lot of you got this pinned up thing right now. Because you ain't been watching sports like me. And when you ain't been watching it, you just kind of pinned up because you're used to screaming all over the living room. So this is a good place to turn your praise loose. I said this is a good place to turn your praise loose. Amen. I'm just practicing for the next service. Next one, he determined to trust in God. I'm going to trust you, God. Verse 9 says, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away. See, first he said, I'm going to seek your face, God, but don't turn away from me. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and my mother forsake me. You ever felt forsaken by family? David said, I have. Lord, you'll receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in the straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. When I read what David's saying here, many times when we've had a sibling issues and relational issues in family, and you feel like your, your mother, your father, whatever, has turned away from you, you get a victim mentality. David didn't have that. David turned back toward God and said, you know what? I, I know you are my father. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in the straight path. Amen. Don't turn me over to them. Stick with me. Then he goes on to say he determined to look for God in every situation. If there's one verse you want to underline, you you want to learn to quote it, you want to say it, is this verse 13. I'm still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
Amen. I'm looking toward not just the end of uh, to, uh, the next year, but the end of 2020. I'm believing God for the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm looking forward to it. I'm praying for my children and my grandchildren. Amen. That they'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In other words, I know when I get to heaven, everything's going to be all right. But right now in the land of the living, where I'm at today, I'm believing God for the best. Can I get an amen? amen. That it's going to happen here. He determined to lean on God's strength. Verse 14, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. David discerned he, that he was in the hardest season of all. You know what it is? The waiting season. The waiting season is the hardest season you have ever been in your life. Amen. To wait for God. Amen. To be strong and to wait on Him. When you wait, wait you know, for all you deer hunters out there, that waiting... Just for that moment, H, for that, for that one beautiful set of backstrap to come out of the woods. Come on. That moment, that waiting moment, the thinking of the sizzling and the backstrap and the skillet and the gravy and the potatoes and biscuits. Oh, Jesus, I love you. I wait on you. I wait on you. I'm giving you a good scenario of wait. The hard part of waiting is waiting on your son and daughter to come back to God. The hard part of waiting is for the spouse to get right with Jesus. The hard part of waiting is wondering if that seed that you had sown is going to start bringing forth a crop of blessing into your life when you're financially almost bankrupt. That waiting on God. Amen. Through this season. And David said it again. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. He says it twice. <clears throat> so David focused on his faith, resisted fear. He practiced serving God in the good times. He gave God what he wanted. He determined to trust God. He determined to look for God in every situation. I know you hear God. And he leaned on him for strength. And he waited on God in the, in the hard times, amen, that trouble would not overcome him. There is life through seasons. When Noah, after the flood, and the, and the ark landed on wherever, I guess Mount Ararat, verse 20 of chapter 8 of the book of Genesis, when Noah built an ark to the Lord and taken some of all the clean animals, after he landed there, the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelt the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again. You know what moves God? It's a sacrifice. It's easy to give what you got, but it's one thing to sacrifice. Amen. To release something and give over to Him. It, it moves Him because He sees your heart is like His. He said, and never again will I curse the ground because of man. Even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures. Listen to this verse, church. As long as the earth endures, seed, time, and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. It's never going to stop. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in, in number and, be, and, and fill the earth. Hold this verse just a minute. As long as the earth endures. Let me say this from this pulpit. I believe in climate change. But not as you're hearing it pushed from the government. This climate has always changed. This climate has all... The earth is groaning. The earth is going through stuff. But watch this. It's going through seasons. Yeah. Amen. It, it has summer. It has fall. It has winter. It has spring. And during those times, the earth is changing. Climate is changing. It's not like it was. Then people move on. Of course, concrete changes things. Amen. California is so funny. They they screaming about it's climate change that started the fires. It was it, look, arson started that fire. The climate, climate's always going to change. There's always going to be fires. I mean, especially as long as you leave shrubs shoved up next to the trees. <clears throat> okay, I'm just pulling for the president on that one. <laughs> but when I read this, as long as the earth endures, seed, time, and harvest, you can't stop seasons. You can't shut it down. You can't say no. I'm tired of the cold. Bring on spring. No, get a coat. Yeah, right. yeah. Come on, 
Turn on the heater. You're not going to change seasons. God said, I put it in motion, man, and I've never stopped it. Now, while it's in motion, learn what's going on. There's a time to plant seed. There's a time to give it time, and there's time to harvest it. Many times we get out of, uh, out of uh, what, what's the word, uh, out of alignment, out of sync with what's happening around us, and, and we don't plant when we should be planting. You plant in the springtime. You harvest, amen, as you move toward the summer. There's times to plant. Look in your life and say, now, i got to discern the season of my life that I'm going through. There's a time for me to plant. For David, he said, I sacrificed. Amen. I, I laid down a sacrifice sacrifice to God. There's something about giving. I mean, Noah. Noah gave a sacrifice when he got off the boat. Here's what I'd have been thinking. I've been on this boat for 360 something days. Then I get off this boat. The land has been flooded. Everything is killed. Everything's dead. The only thing living is on the boat. The only thing living is right here on the boat. And then God says, or Noah feels like, I need to sacrifice to God. So he brings out the animals. Let me read it again here to you. So he, he brings out, uh, so, taking some of all the clean animals, all the clean animals, and clean birds. In other words, he didn't eat the ravens. He didn't eat the buzzards. How I many know so there's some dirty birds out there? Amen. Uh, we skinned a deer, and I mean, within an hour and a half of skinning a deer and dropping a carcass, we came back and the buzzards were on it. How in the world they got that sniffer? A spies or something. They all over that carcass an hour and a half. They were out there flying around. It. Most, uh, Noah didn't grab dirty birds. He got the quail. He got the pigeons. Amen. He got the turkeys. Huh? He got the ducks. And he hauled them out there and he sacrificed them. I'm thinking to myself, I just landed. The only, only food around here is on my boat. There ain't nothing out here living. And all of a sudden, I feel God nudging me and saying, I think it's time to sacrifice. And I took the best of what I had, and I sold it. That's what he did. S-O-W-E-D. He sold that, and it pleased God. Amen. And then God said, then God said, seed, time, and harvest. If you plant seed, give it time and wait on the harvest because it's coming. Many of you have planted your entire life. You have been kind toward others. You've poured into their life. You've, you've poured into the houses of God. Amen. You've been a blessing to others. Give it time and watch the harvest. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I've seen God over and over pour into my life and I continue to sow seed. I'm not going to stop sowing seed because somebody said, well, times are rough and all the food we got is on the boat. That's revelation right there, by the way. I just gave you. I've never heard that preached or said it before. Come on, Jesus. Amen. Some of you are bringing the best out in me right now. The seasons of God. Amen. Our, our plan. Our plan and design. Provision is God's promise. Industrious people are God's command. I read over and over. God does not like for folk to be lazy. He, not, he wants us to be progressive, to keep moving on. Amen. God rules over the seasons. Daniel said in chapter 2, verse 21, He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and, and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. I say vote. Don't just sit back and say, all right, well, I'll just let God deal with it. You vote. Let's believe God for the best. And then we have to accept the verdict. Amen. But I'm going to say something to you. This thing is speeding to an end. We're coming closer and closer to an ending. And however God wants to end this thing up, hallelujah, it may not determine or, or depend on what you think it does. God may have another plan. So I say, God, you set up kings, you tear them down. You put up nations, you tear it down. I just want to be a part of what you're doing. I'm a kingdom man. Hallelujah. I want to stay in the kingdom. God uses the seasons to get our attention. Amen. I know every August God got my attention because it's hot. Come on. It's hot. Amen. I get it. My attention gets called every time. Seasons will wake you up. Amen. When that cold hits, whoo, Jesus. Some of you are going to forget about it. You're going to forget that there was ever hot in the summer. Amen. You'll be grabbing that cold. They'll get your attention. Right now, hurricane season. That's what we call it. Get your attention. How do we discern the seasons? Do we know what season it is? This has to be a sentence, a season of repentance. This has to be a season of a nation turning toward God. This has to be a season where agnostic, atheistic nations 
are being dealt with over and over by plague. So you think that virus is bad here? It's bad everywhere. Amen. And it's waking people up and people are turning toward God. What else are you going to do? Understanding time is short. Amen. So how do I discern seasons? Two ways. First, through wisdom that comes from experience. I know that it's not going to get hot as we move toward December. I discern that. That doesn't make me real smart. That just makes me somebody that's been here a while. I discerned when I moved to South Texas, one does not leave his window down like he did in Alabama. It rains here anytime it wants. It'll just, in, in, in anywhere it wants. Crazy. I discerned these things as I've lived around here. I discerned that mosquitoes show up after a hard rain in the summer. I discerned in June that horse flies <coughs> can knock you off your horse. <laughs> These are things I've discerned. Let me start closing. Chronicles 12, 32. And of the children of Issachar, one of the tribes, which were men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. I have an ear for discerning. I, I know men and women who have a heart for discerning. And I get in touch with them. <clears throat> Friday, I, I talked with Bishop Tony Miller. I got in touch with him. I wanted to hear what he had to say about this time and season. I believe he's one that understands discerning. Two weeks ago, my friend Pastor Rick Hawkins called me in a discerning attitude for a, a pastor friend and acquaintance of ours at 62 that pastored a very large church in Nashville had gone through a split. And he went into a dark place. He didn't pull out. And he took his life. <clears throat> it shattered the church and his family. I'm not demeaning the thorn stones. I'm just telling you what happened. He called me. He said, I just got to check on my friends. Because I'm discerning that this may be the hardest time that we've ever had to pastor. The churches are, are going down. People are quitting. Suicide rate's gone up. Depression has hit. I'm discerning the times. And so when I hear that, I got to tell you so that you can also... Reach out to your friends and connect with them. And find people who, who maybe have been locked in or locked down and encourage them. They deserve the times. There's a season we have at our camp. When camp season hits, it's a season we deal with. Amen. Uh, the little country church, our season is always to be fishing. To going after men and women, to keep fishing for them. America, with all the, that keeps going wrong, it just reminds us that we're one step closer to the coming of the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is probably one of the most heartbreaking scriptures of the end times. It says, but mark this. Understand it. Grasp it. Discern it. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful, proud. They'll become abusive They'll be disobedient to their parents, ungrateful and unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Don't have anything to do with them. This is a last day's mandate. And I read that and I say, you know, at one time or another, I was all of those. At one time or another, you were all of those. Except for the grace of God, there we go again. Amen. And then we look at people we know and love. We say, oh man, they follow. I, I don't point condemning fingers at them. I realize I'm in the last days. Amen. And this is more prevalent. But if the same grace that touched me is still touching me, can touch you. God can bring us through this season. Can I get an amen? Number two, through divine revelation. How do you understand season? Revelation. Seven years of production, seven years of drought, prepare. Joseph had a dream. He had a... Do not think for yourself, Jack, that God can't give you revelation. 
A revelation is when a light bulb goes on. A revelation starts you a new job. A revelation gives you the ability to move into your, uh, I call it prophetic future. When I use the word prophetic, I'm saying the future God has laid out for you. you got a, a future you can do, but God has a prophetic or something that he wants us to do in life. So he lays it out. So when I'm reading this, I realize Joseph had these dreams. And, and, and he woke up. I, when I get a dream, I try to get, write it down real quick. I, 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 tell, I had a dream the other day, Sue, that uh, Angela and Ronald had walked up to me in the dream after she had her surgery. And I sent a message to, to Angela. I, I dreamed about you and you. And I say, when I see that, I pray for people. If you get in my dreams, that means you are either agitating me a little bit or I really love you. Amen. Either way, when you get in a dream, you got to pray for them. Amen. And then get a revelation. God, what is it you have? What is it you got for my future? And begin to ask God for that. John 17, 14 through 18. And I'm not going to read it to you, but it says we're in the world, but we're not of this world. Psalm chapter 1. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Amen. So I'm hanging out with God. I'm learning. So I'm in sync with the season and in harmony with the word. I know I said I was going to close, but you're doing good. I'm rolling here. Isaiah 43, 2. <clears throat> when you pass through. Everybody say through. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. There are through seasons, and that's what we're doing right now. We're moving through a season, and we're learning, and we're growing. Thessalonians says, in everything, in every season, give thanks. This season, give God more thanks. You know, necessity is the mother of all inventions. When, you, when it's necessary to do something. You know, six, seven, eight months ago, we had a drive-in service. You know why we had a drive-in service? Out of necessity. Necessity was the mother of invention. The revelation was to get an FM receiver. That just don't happen. I didn't get something in the mail that says, hey, by the way, next week you're not going to have church, get an FM receiver and have people show up on the par- on, well, in, in cars. I didn't get that. That was downloaded into my spirit. Amen. Coming back from Colorado, I saw it. Amen. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest. It's not going to change. I plant seed. Give it time. There comes a harvest. God has ordained that life comes in seasons. He's promised provision for the lifespan of the earth. This earth, listen to me, you cannot destroy this earth. North Korea cannot destroy this earth. The Republicans cannot destroy this earth. The Democrats may have, no, they cannot destroy this earth. Amen. No one can destroy this earth till God is done with it. Are you hearing me? Your hairspray can't do it. You can't destroy it. Your, your gasoline and your Chevrolet can't do it. You can't destroy this earth. Can't do it. As long as the earth endures. Seed time harvest. And God said, just so you understand what I'm saying, let me slap this big rainbow up in the sky for you. To remind you, I'll never flood the earth again. Amen. And I don't care what group tries to take over that rainbow. That's God's bow, my friend. All them colors, all that beauty. I've sat at the bottom of a rainbow on my horse in a drenched rain. Amen. And look down there. There wasn't no leprechaun there. That, that bow ain't no Irish thing. That's God telling us, I promise you. I promise you. And you know what? I didn't just put that bow up for Noah. I put that bow up for David's time. I put it up for Ruth's time. When the disciples walked the earth and the rains came, I let the disciples see it too. Amen. I've thrown that bow up for thousands of years. And I'll continue to put that rainbow up to remind you seed time and harvest. Amen. I'll never flood the earth again. Though the inclination of man's heart is always evil. Amen. I still love man. For God so loved the world he gave. I promise you. I stand on that. Many fail because they get out of sync. With time, place. They get a failure anticipating mindset. Because your efforts to achieve have been out of season. You've got to discern the win. I had a teacher in college, and he said this every year at the closing of the year. Some ships sail east, some sail west. By the self-same winds that blow, it's not the strength of the gale, but the set of the sail that determines which way it will go. 
So the winds may blow, but you don't have to let them destroy you. You just set your sail. Stand with me. Our lifetime is the soil in which our destiny is sown, cultivated and harvested. Our time on earth, if not used properly, will cost us our God-given destiny. And destiny is expensive. How we spend our time on earth ultimately determines what will be recorded about us in eternity. Or as your preacher has said over and over again, what we do here matters there. The harvest is past. The summer has ended. And we are not saved. Let it not be said of us that this verse means anything to us other than a warning to reach people in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. It's a season for you to discern what's fixing to happen. Those watching online, listen to me. Your prophetic future is so important. What God has planned for you. And if you allow this season just to move past, and, and if you don't press in and do that which God has called you to do, you don't sow seed, you don't believe God for time and then a harvest, you're missing it. I, I, I believe God right now. I rebuke fear and the desire to, to just shut down through this time. God, I thank you that you press us through. Now, I, I'm asking you this question, and I do often, but if you've been away from God, would you throw your hand up right now? Just let me pray with you if you've been away. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I'm talking about. Can we pray this together? Jesus, this is my time. This is my day. I sow my life into this season. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. Give me direction. God, I ask for a clean heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Amen. So I'm going to say this to you one more time because I want to, re you know, repetition is a powerful thing. Pastor, you repeat a lot. I know I'm, a, it's okay to be a repeater. Listen, he focused on his faith and resisted fear. You have faith. You believe God for great things. You know, my, my, I have a daughter that's 800 miles away from me. Uh, I have to believe God for my grandkids you know, she calls the dad, I'm going to Arizona for three weeks to train a dog uh, to help work in the prisons. Uh, train it to bite, Mandy. Because I'm not there. You got to trust God. Then I've, I've, there are other things in my life. You, you, so I have to resist fear. He practiced serving God in the good times. Man, when things are good, don't beat yourself up. Don't go, I feel so bad. I feel so bad that things are going so good for me. Amen. Dogs healthy, cats gone, cars are running good. My wife loves me. She brought me a glass of tea. Oh, life is so good. Don't beat yourself up when life is good. Amen. When your kids come in and say, hey, hey, mom, dad, I made an extra thousand this week and I just wanted to bless you with it. I didn't need. Don't get upset over that. <laughs> just receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. And post it on Facebook so the whole world knows. Huh. Yeah, he, he gave God what he wanted. That was worship. David determined to trust God. He, to look for God in every situation. He determined to lean on God for his strength. What are you determined to do with your troubles when you're overwhelmed? I'm going to trust you. Mm, Father, I love you. I love this house. I love you people. Thank you for your word. We're going to get through this. We're going to grow through this. We're going to learn through this season. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Be seated if you would. There in front of you is uh, offering envelopes and things of that nature. Uh, I do solicit your prayers this week. Thank you, Joseph. I do solicit your prayers this week as uh, we head to Alabama. You know I'm going to be on my scooter, so I just just want to get the wind in get the wind in my mustache. I'd say hair, but I'm probably going to be wearing a helmet. I'm learning, practicing that, uh, so I get it in my stash. But uh, just keep in mind, right after church, 
The wonderful riches over here are going to have a seniors with a purpose. Seniors, please stay. Hang out with them. Fellowship. Amen. Encourage one another as the Word of God teaches. You got your offer envelope there. If you give him by phone, and let me just say thank you. You know, I, I just don't, I just, yeah, I don't think I say it enough. But you, you do sow seed into this place. You sow seed during the car show and during the conference to keep our missionaries. You know, Josiah Ramirez was up. His daddy was up here, Sergio. We've been, we've been. Uh, I guess 15 years we've been supporting that family in Mexico. Now they're in New Mexico, and so they're transitioning out of uh, Mexico into New Mexico. But thank you because you, you're a blessing to help missions and others. Uh, and when we go places like Louisiana or Florida to help during hurricane relief, you've been there, you've helped out. So I appreciate you honoring God because that's what you're doing. You're honoring God with your giving. So make sure you do that today. Those online... We're starting to see more and more people from online outside the state send finances to the little country church and give their tithe. I want to thank you for that. I don't mind being your pastor. I may never meet you. Amen. But who knows? We might connect somewhere, somehow, some way. Amen. And David, as you come to close in prayer, so don't forget that uh, there'll be a prayer meeting here Tuesday night. HD's back in the house. They've been gone for a little bit. Now they're back. So uh, there'll be a prayer here Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And each Tuesday night at 7 except for whenever there's first week, midweek, there'll be a Bible study. And there will be a trunk retreat here on this campus October the 31st from 6 to 8 o'clock. Now, I need to mention, oh, you guys on the 17th are going to Twisted River Ranch, Mike, the 4x4 group. Amen. That's going to be great for you guys to do. On the back tables, Lucinda. I love Lucinda. I so appreciate her and Mike. They're such a blessing. Y'all give them a hand. She's been greeting <laughs> Lucinda, I did not ask you, but you are the dispatcher for Montgomery County. Did you send that message to Baptist Encampment telling them that somebody was speeding? You did? Well, why didn't you call me and give me a heads up? Who do you think speeding over there? What's that? Oh, my God. Five new trucks. I got... Yeah, I met one. Nice guy. Nice guy. Uh, that's sweet. Yeah, I'll meet them all before it's over. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, there will be a retreat for the ladies on November the 20th through 21st. I think it's been five or six years since the ladies have had a retreat. Sign-ups are in the back. I think it's $60 for the weekend. Amazing things they're going to be doing, though, for, for 48 hours. Actually, a little bit longer than that. Ladies, please sign up. There is a, uh, uh, a cutoff date. And the cutoff of how many people can go. So, ladies, set at the feet of Jesus. Learn from him. Sign up in the back. Enjoy the fellowship. Amen. Amen. And as far as the off-road Miss Fritz, that is going to be Travis. If you guys are looking for that, uh, this, he will be leading that one. Uh, so see him if you have any questions. Uh, just grateful for this church. Amen. Everybody that's on staff here is just grateful for you guys. For you guys' continual support and your prayers. We need it, obviously, in these times. We need vision. We need grace. We need wisdom. And so I'm just grateful for you guys that you guys are continually praying for us and giving to us. You guys are consistent in that. We're grateful for you. Today we believe in God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises. Finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates in return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, and success to the kingdom. <laughs> it's all good. We're good. <laughs> hey, uh, seriously, I just want to pray with you guys, let you guys go. Uh, obviously, give in the back. They're standing back there waiting for you. But uh, just, just seriously, want to say thank you. Continue, uh, and this is October. This is Pastor Appreciation Month. I believe at the end of the month, we're going to have um, buckets in the back, which is going to be a little different because now there's giving buckets in the back. and uh, So we're going to have to differentiate that somehow. But we want to make sure our pastor is blessed. We want him to realize and recognize, you know what, we can give him a hand clap every week, but that don't buy stuff. That don't get stuff. I mean, the reality, you want somebody to know that you love them, what? You give. That's why God wanted us to know that he loved us. He gave his son. And so if you 
want our pastor to know he's loved, he's appreciated. We're going to give into him. We don't really know. I asked him and he said, you know, I don't really know. There's nothing I necessarily want. So I said, oh, well, we'll figure something out. But <laughs> yeah, well, he wants a lot of backstraps. <laughs> We're hoping the Lord helps provide with that. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just give to our pastor, especially in this time. I mean, as, as crazy as it has been, he really has been on the cusp in the forefront of being able to lead this church in a way that continues to strengthen us. Most churches are on the downside, and we're can, we have momentum, we're going forward, and that's really because our pastor has his ear to the ground and saying, okay, God, what you got next? Amen. Lord, I love you. I thank you. I bless every person in here, and I bless everybody online. I just pray that they have an incredible week. Let them to recognize and realize that, Lord, they are your sons and your daughters, and you want them blessed. You want them overflowing. But, Lord, first we have to learn to give because it is given, and then it is pressed down, shaken together and overflowing. And, Lord, so, Lord, let us to learn to give. And, Lord, let us to learn that you are the one. You are what we need when we need it. And so, Lord, we're asking for your grace, for your mercy to just go with us and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.